Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for staying, for creating a web series. Um, it's the kind of thing that I do a lot. Uh, it's an overview of the class that I teach at UCLA and the book that I wrote called Automatic Pilot. I look at this from here at the LF web outside. I've never done this before. Outside is great. Um, so I'm going to cover quickly um, the steps that I suggest we go through. That's outlined in my book because it's all about the process. So whether you're making a traditional media project or a web series project or whatever it is, they're the creative development steps. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me first. Um, I come from Queens. Somebody was from South Jamaica here before. I don't know where they are. I come from not far from there. I call it Simon and Garfunkel country. Uh, I always was enamored of television. I mean, the highlight of my life as a teenager growing up would be to go down to Rockefeller Center and hang out at NBC Studios. Nothing was more glamorous than that. So television was always a passion of mine. Not so much feature films, but that's just me. Um, I went into advertising because if you want to stay on the creative side of things in New York without I was too chicken to move, um, you go into advertising. And it was the best second segments, you have tons of money to play with as a creator, editing, writing, well, you, to a point of excess, because most of the money is spent on media. So when they're spending $20 million on media, if you're going to spend an extra $50,000 to make a commercial, okay, try it. So we can play. Right. So that, there, I got into television. I had to come out to California and L.A. A gentleman named Hal Linden from commercials where he used to use a lot on voiceovers in New York, and he was fabulous. And he was starring in this series called Barney Miller, which people might not even remember now. Uh, and so I said, Hal, I said, that's the kind of show I'd like to write. I mean, that's that New York sense of humor, it's the kind of thing I would like to write. He said, okay, write a spec script. I'll see that the producer gets it. I did. I've never written a spec script before, and like everybody else who struggles with their first spec script, I'm looking at on the margins right, you know, is the dialogue centered enough, and all the stuff that's unimportant. Um, but it was critical. I mean, this was an ABC network show. Didn't hear a word. So I wrote another spec, gave it to Hal, he gave it to the producer. Didn't hear a word. I wrote another spec. <laughs> gave it to Hal, he gave it to the producer, I got a call from this guy who was a real Damon Rennie kind of character saying, hey Talby, all right, listen, here's the deal, you're a good writer, you're funny, I'm not going to use your script, come on in, I'll give you stories that we'd like you to write, and that got me started, all right, and that was traditional media, now the way to stay relevant, just about in anything, I think is to keep reinventing yourself, because the technology has changed everything. And for all the people who do not embrace the technology, I think you're going to be left at the starting gate. Experiment. Uh, all these things, these, these vehicles that we have, whether it be the cameras, as I started saying in another session before, everything has gotten so much more user-friendly. Right? So. I try to cut out the middlemen whenever I can. And I started teaching at UCLA uh, back in the 90s doing um, episodic TV writing because I had learned, and I think we talked about it in another session from my Hill Street Blue days, that being a good episodic writer is being a good mimic because you have to learn how to deconstruct the show that has been created and duplicate it. Totally different skill set than writing something original. That's why I advise writers, and I know that a lot of people advise them differently. They say, oh, well, all you need to do is write a spec pilot these days, and we'll take a look at it, and we'll read it. If we like the spec pilot, we'll call you in, and you'll get on staff. When I'm running a show, I also want to see that you can mimic. 
I don't care whether I like the show or not like the show or am familiar with the show or not familiar with the show. I'd love to know that you can mimic something that's not you and at the same time take a look at a pilot that you've written um, that is your passion. I want to know who you are. You know, it used to be, I remember I had a network meeting in New York, uh, just a general get to meet meeting, and this was like after Desperate Housewives had been on, which changed the whole landscape of everything because it was a show that came from a spec pilot, which they never encouraged you to write a look at. And I was sitting with the executives and they said, well, you know, we read all your material, it's good. Do you have a spec pilot? And I said, yeah, I, I, I do. As a matter of fact, I had just one script to lose it or something like that. I said, yeah, I, I, I absolutely do, uh, but why? And they said, uh, well, quite frankly, if we read your Sex in the City or Veep or whatever it might be, we don't know who you are. And I said, well, truthfully, up until this moment, nobody cared who I was. <laughs> but that changed the whole landscape. And now a flood of spec pilots started to get written not just by new people trying to enter, but by established people who didn't want to go through the hell of development from a pitch. They'd sit down, they'd write their spec pilots, and a lot of the shows that you see that get on are coming from established people who wrote their spec project. That doesn't happen with outsiders. It happens in the sense that I recommend you write a spec pilot, that's a passion project, right? but at the same time, realize that that's not going to be bought by CBS and appear on CBS in the fall. That's going to probably be read by a show producer who says, ooh, this, this, this is cool, i got to talk to him. Right? Call you in for a meeting and get to know you, which is always fun. In fact, I tell people there are two sides of the business that you really need to cultivate both of them. And that is do the work and network. Networking is just as important as the work. And these days, I know people aren't always in Los Angeles, which is where we all network. But you can network socially on social media and get to meet just about anybody you want. You get to be friends with anybody you want and get them to know you. And then you do the work. And anybody who's been in this town for a month would realize that these are not Anybody who can develop the craft can wind up in this business. I grew up in a four network universe, three, four network universe. There are now 50 networks. There are over 420 scripted shows. They have to go way beyond the A list, <laughs> or the B list, or the C list. They're down to M somewhere, you know, trying to staff these things. Are you going to make that work money? Of course not. Are you going to make good human money? Yes. Okay. So I say there's tremendous opportunity in television. I don't see it in teachers. That's just, you know, the way I view the businesses. They're two separate businesses. As a matter of fact, I, I recommend to my writers or people I meet, and I go like, they say, you know, I, uh, I just want it. I want my feature to get made. I want some studio to pick it up, and I want that, I mean, you know, whatever. I wrote it, I love it, I said, uh, I want to see it on that big screen. And I go like, that's that's really very good. That's I, I, I totally understand your passion. I might not share it, but I totally understand your passion. I say, realistically, the biggest screen your show will get, your movie will get shown on is 70 inches in my movie. That is a pilot. And let's see which one comes home first. Okay, that's all. It's the same project. Now we have web series. And I love web series because my whole thing has been trying to empower writers by cutting out the middlemen. I mean, some of the things I do, I, I do my own writing. I just finished writing a pilot that I'm now packaging. 
uh, an hour traditional pilot. I consult, I have my book, I consult, I do lectures, I do on, on these things, all on the internet. I joined my wife's network marketing business, Arbon, which is a health and wellness company because creative people need a way to make money so they can spend time on the creative projects. And because of the internet, she's and we, we're working in six countries from our kitchen table. It's a different world and it's direct from the person who creates it or the factory to, to the consumer. For years, people in my classes were telling me that, oh, I should write a book. Oh my God, this is so good. You should put it, you should put it in a book form. I didn't want any part of it. I said, I don't want to deal with agents. I don't want to deal with managers. I don't want to deal with editors. That's, it's not, I'm not doing it to make money. It's not going to happen. And then about three or four years ago, a friend of mine who is, I call her the guru of self-publishing, um, said, well, why don't you self-publish? Oh, I said, well, okay. You just write it and it goes to the consumer. It's the Amazon, right? So I try to get as direct as I possibly can. So I encourage you, and I know we have a lot of talk here about making money and how you're going to monetize it and how you're going to sell it and how you're going to get a distribution and all that kind of stuff. My goal for writers is to empower them to move up the ladder of their careers. The first uh, web series I made, when I, I made it cheaply, inexpensively, As a matter of fact, my web series production company I named Pizza for 10 Productions, which is, which is what it cost me. Um, <laughs> didn't go anywhere in terms of views, in terms of uh, YouTube or viral or anything like that. It was simply done in my living room with, with improv actors. It's called Psychobabble. It's group therapy and whatever it might be. But, and this is the way I think people need to look at things. They need to look at the wider picture. A production company saw my web series and hired me to write, rewrite two of their animated features. So how much money did I make on my web series? Right? And you really need to see that wider view of once you have stuff to show that represents you and your voice and your originality, how that can pay off for you without thinking that the thing that you just created has to pay off for you. These are vehicles that go any different direction. As a matter of fact, the way I, I talk about environments today, creative environments, when you create a project, create think of it as a wheel where you have a hub. The hub of the wheel could be a movie script, it could be a play, it could be a web series, it could be a television series, but you have all these spokes coming out of it, right? Well, one spoke could be Facebook pages of your characters, one spoke could be, uh, you know, marketing of various things from your project, whether it be t-shirts or ashtrays or calendars or whatever. One spoke could be the other platforms, you know, the web series becomes a traditional series, the traditional series becomes a web series, on and on and on. And so you have a whole environment that you're creating from that hub. And I think that's a really good way to look at things these days because the way costs are going, no individual execution of something is really going to pay for itself. It's going to be very difficult. And if you have one that is that popular, the way you maximize the profits is by accessorizing it. So here we go to the steps. I called my book Automatic Pilot for a reason. My theory is that the work you do in development is more important or where the mistakes get made than the work you do writing the script. And I, in my 10 week class for UCLA, I, they don't start writing the script till week five, week six. And the reason for that is I think just like a pilot for an airline has to go down a checklist before he takes off so he doesn't crash and burn. All right, now it's not life or death with writing, but I think pilot writers or any writer should do the same. 
go down a checklist of all the things and all the decisions you want to make before you start writing that 60 or 40 or 120 page script and get halfway through it and go like, where the hell am I? All right. So I spend a lot of time on that. As a matter of fact, I had a producer call me from Paramount. And she was, they're great, I love them. But she said, you know, we're having trouble with the pilot. We'd love you to come in and help us. We'll write the first drift, draft and you'll come in and you'll, you'll tell us what you think and where, you know, where we can improve it. I said, no, no, it's not, it's not gonna work that way. Because quite frankly, it's much, much harder to deconstruct something than it is to construct something. I said, what I would like to do is I'd like to come in on day one and take you through all the checkpoints that I've listed. And when you're ready to write that script, you've got it all done, I'm gone. So I work differently, which is why I say, when I do my consulting business, I tell people, look, I'll work with you week to week, step to by step. And if you don't want to go to the next step, you don't have to, you know, because I'm just taking you through each of the checkpoints. So, why a web series? You know, you're all here. How many here are writers, by the way? I just wanted to get a sense of that. And actors? Oh, so you see our hyphenates. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Don't scare me. <laughs> so, a web series is the only platform that you control from concept to completion, all right? And if you look around at this web fest, you can see the interest there is in web series. I mean, I was here last year, and I'll give you something that I'll send you later on. Um, I was here last year because I ran a seminar for the Writers Guild called Creating a Web Series, because I'm always trying to empower writers to stop bitching about their agents. And, call them. <laughs> um, and saying, you have the power in your hands. With the digital age, you have the power in your hands to be more in control of your destiny. With IMDb Pro and Variety and Insight and all those other things, you can get to just about any entity you want to get to directly if you have the right material to show. And so I think that with that ability, you really want to take a look and say, what can I do that just represents me? You know, don't worry. I mean, I have people come up to me and they'll say, I had one guy come up to me and said, look, I, I, I'd like to read you something. He reads me something and he gets a comedy and he says, do you think that's funny? And I looked at him and I said, do you think it's funny? And he said, yeah. I said, then it's funny. That's all. You're writing for yourself. You're creating for yourself. The only chance, or the best chance you have, in my view, of getting into the, getting on the train, is coming in with something that's unique to you. And we all are unique. All right. As I point out, they do not need you for Law and Order. They need you for Transparent. They need you for that thing that was not on their radar. They need you for the thing that came from wherever it came from that's you. And I often tell writers, because I go through this discussion a lot of times where people tell writers, write what you know. And I go, no, 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 no. If I wrote what I know, it would be a Jewish kid in Queens, you know, and it's just, it's just, it's just a done to death. I said, I was very impacted when I saw the Writers Guild a screenwriter by the name of Robert Town, who's very, very well respected. He wrote Chinatown and all sorts of things. And he was accepting an award, and he was talking to a group of 500, 600 writers. And he said, you know, I think the trouble with writers these days is they've lost their vision. Uh, I think they're trying to write for a marketplace. I think they're trying to write for an actor. I think they're trying to write for a network. I think they're trying to write what they think is hot or what's going to sell. He said, not good enough. It's very simple. Well, because well, I've been told, for me, because I'm like, I'm writing for myself, but then someone came and told me, you, you need to write for your, who, well, who's your target audience kind of thing. It's like, well, but I want to write for myself. So yeah, that's what yeah. People, they're telling people. Is, yeah, yeah, but something. I'm yeah. telling you is, Believe me, the things that, and, and I'd, I'd like to save the questions for the end, for the end. No, no problem, okay. I'll answer this now, is that it, once you start doing that, you're doing things that they can get elsewhere. Yeah. 
right? They don't need you for that. You know, once once you start, to, your main goal, which will make the whole process of writing more fun, yeah. is to write what you're passionate about. And then you will find, where can I place this? So as I say, my workshop is very simple. You do the work first, and then you'll figure out where to shop it. It's not the other way around, right? I mean, the other way around is you're looking for a paycheck. All right. The thing is that what happens is you now stand out from everybody else. You now have something that people will want. And as I started to say before, there are now 50 networks, 400 shows. They all have to brand themselves. I mean, coming out, even when I was working syndication, we had to get five or 10 million viewers for it to last. These days, and you could look at the hottest shows on television, you can look at Mad Men, you can look at whatever it is that would never survive on a network, they get 700,000 viewers. All right? So it's not, it, everything has become narrow casting, not broadcasting. It's all niche. So if you write something that appeals to you, I promise you it will appeal to somebody else. Your goal then becomes trying to find that somebody else which you can do easier with you know all the tools that are available to you to to reach wherever you wanted to reach uh -huh. and that's your best shot and not only that it makes the process of writing so much more fun yeah. this guy is writing something that he thinks is funny not wondering oh crap are they gonna think it's funny oh, I, I think it's funny yeah. if he thinks it's funny somebody else is gonna it might not be me <laughs> Yeah. But somebody else is going to think it's funny, right. or somebody else is going to like it. And you can look, anything that I look at that I think is iconic, you know, that we talk about, whether it be all in the family, Seinfeld, but go on down the line, all right, are done by people who didn't know the rules, broke the rules, or didn't care about the rules. Right. And that's the way I view it. So how do we do that? You know, you 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 realize that you need to work, you know, from something that's totally original. And the first slide that I would show you is the Robert Town slide. Right what you want to see. <laughs> if you were writing a book, I'd say write what you want to read. If you were doing music, I'd say write what you want to listen to. You know, don't don't let all that other junk enter your head. It's a different goal. It's like, I don't know if you were here with the town, they were, the business people were talking about how the distribution and they're making money. And that's not your goal. Your goal is to break into the industry. Your goal is to get some showrunner or some network or some say, say, oh, when did this person show up in town? Hello, let me meet him, all right? Now, you might wind up on a show that is similar to what you've written. You know, if you're in the horror mold, you know, they're not, they're not going to put you on deep. Or maybe they will. <laughs> or maybe they will. Who knows these days? Um, but the thing is that, so I say, write what you want to see, what is your sweet spot? Because that's where you want to wind up. So, once we pass write what you want to see, we get to... What's your checklist? You know, what are the things that you're going to go down that you're going to have to delineate to make your, your project different, to make your project unique? The first thing you want is a concept. What is your concept? All right, I'm out of advertising, so this is gonna be a lot of advertising stuff. And you're gonna say, well, advertising is about products. Television is a project is a product. Web series are a product. Anybody who's out of marketing knows that the one thing they tell you to look at when you're looking at trying to create a campaign for anything in advertising is what's the unique selling proposition. What makes this product unique from every other product out there? Even if you had, a, I know I had parody products like Pepsi-Cola and Coca-Cola, make up a uniqueness. It's got more bubbles, you know, it goes better with vodka, whatever, you know, you have to make up something that makes what you're doing unique. 
So I translated that unique selling proposition into my first chapter, in which, which is called the concept, into the IOU. The IOU is very simply this. Do not go any further until this is completed. What is the big idea? What is the origin of that idea? Because the origin will also often explain your passion for it. So, was it some crazy uncle? Was it an article you read? Was it a trip you took that really impacted you? What was the origin of it? And the most important part, the you, what makes it unique? If you can't come up with what makes it unique, it's, it just makes the job that much. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it makes the job that much harder. All right. If you want to do fathers and daughters or sons and sisters or whatever it might be, you know, fine. It's, you know, it's a low concept and it just makes it that much harder because when you start to tell somebody about it, you say, well, there's a family and that, yeah, see, they live in the mountain. No, forget it. You used to say, does it work on the billboard? What's the billboard? And that's the first thing you want to come up with. Now, what I what I suggest people do is, and I get, I learned this from that very first show I want. I, I often say I had some great teachers and executive producers that taught me exactly what I would like to try and pass on. And I've had the other kind that I go, well, I don't even want to mention their name. All right. The very first producer used to say, you know, you got this idea, great, put it on the side. You know why? That's the one that's closest to the surface come up with another idea. You're gonna to have to dig a little deeper to come up with that other idea. Go for it. You can always come back to that first one, but I want you to dig a little deeper and come up with another one. And if you're a writer in this business, you're not a, you know, you're not a one trick pony. Um, come up with the other idea, great, put that on the side. Come up with a third one. He always worked in threes. I don't know if he was religious or not. The thing is that you come up with three. You go, now of the three, which is your favorite? And I have to tell you, with my students in the, in the classes, many of them come in with, oh, I have been wanting to do this now for two years. I finally get the chance and I go, right, great. Put it on the side, think of two others. Many of them often pick that second and third choice that they hadn't spent the time digging deeper on. So in all the elements, and these are the steps that I say you go through before you start writing your script. I go like, okay, you've got your concept. What are your characters? Again, you've got choices. It's not a given. And one of the examples I use is the odd couple. Anybody knows the odd couple? You know, the, the older guy, you know, the schlemiel and the, the other guy getting divorced? It's a great, it's hysterical. It's a wonderful thing. Who else could be the characters? Ooh, well, I guess it could be two women. They've done it that way. Oh, I guess it could be uh, a diverse group, you know, one black, one white, one Chinese, one what, not white. Oh, been done that way. So give yourself the flexibility of thinking of the choices that will make your project unique in every one of the elements. If you look at the procedurals, which there are a ton of them, Law and Order was the granddaddy, no question. Law and Order was the granddaddy, it's still on. A friend of mine, I think he bought a chalet, has been working on it for 25 years. Um, if you look at the others, you will see that they always hone in on a unique element, even though they're a procedural. You will have a guy that's great at, at math, it becomes numbers. You will have somebody who's a psychic, it becomes medium. You will have a group of geniuses. It becomes Scorpion. They create that unique element that separates them from everything else. And that's what they hone in on like a laser because nobody else does that. Even though they're procedural. Right? Then we talk about locations. We say, oh, well, uh, I mean, this is obviously a New York show. I mean, it's cops, it's New York, it's this. I said, is it really? Great. Where else could it be said? Huh? Mm. Uh, I don't know. How about Sarasota? Ooh, it becomes an entirely different show. How about Calgary? <laughs> it becomes an entirely different show.
So all these elements, when you go through the choices, will help make your project along the way that much more unique. And the same thing comes when you say, okay, now we want to talk about stories. Well, what kind of stories do you want to tell? Do you want to tell stories that are about the family and just have just, as we say, an A story going through it? Or do you want to have an A and B story? Do you want to have an A, B, C story? Oh, okay. Well, let's see. What if I try it just an A story? Okay, try it that way. That's the nice thing about writing. It costs you nothing but time. And so you do that with every one of the elements. And then you go through, I often make them say, people come in and they say, oh, I want to do, I got it, I know what I want to do, it's this series, it's a half hour sitcom. I go, really? Terrific. Have you thought of it as a drama? Ooh, no. Have you thought of it as an animated show? Ooh, no. Why don't you think of it that way? You know, as I point out to people, and I take iconic elements like Modern Family, I guess everybody here knows this series, Modern Family. I said, look at that show closely. That could have been a soap opera. Right? Oh, I'm glad they didn't think of it that way. <laughs> but all I'm saying is you're giving, you, you're, you're clearing your mind of your preconceptions. And you're putting on the table all your options. And nobody has to know what they are but you. So that to me is the easiest way to come up with um, uh, something that's unique all the way down. Let me see if I can get this. So what happens then is I go like, okay, now is your show going to be, and these, this is writerly terms, so I'll explain it. Is your show going to be open or closed? And by open, that means that each episode is complete in and of itself, all right? Not only is it complete in and of itself, but the audience in an open show gets to see the good guys and the bad guys. You know, you see what the good guys are doing, and then you get to see what the bad guys are doing. So you're privy to everything that the other side is not privy to. A closed show goes like, uh-uh. The audience is only gonna know what our lead characters know. All right. Same show, two different styles. All right. So you wanna think these things through. That's why I say I wanna think these things through and give myself a combination of the best recipe I can come up with before I start writing my script. Right. And then it happens that you go like, okay, I got it all figured out. I, yep, got it. I now am going to write my outline. I say, well, let's take this in two steps. Everybody says it's all about story, 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 story. And I go, yes, story is very important. I'm not saying it's not. But even more important than story is how are you going to execute that story? All right. So I definitely want you to become really, really familiar with what your story is. If you're doing Cinderella, I want you to know that she lived in this house with the three stepsisters and the whatnot, and the stepmother, and they could go to the ball, and she wasn't allowed to go to the ball, and then the fairy godmother came. I want you to know that from A to Z. And that's your synopsis. Now I say, when you're coming to write the script for that, how do you want to plot that out? How about you start when the clock strikes midnight? How about you start when, you know, the fairy godmother comes down and you will backtrack and show that she lived with three ugly sisters or whatever it is. So when you come to execute the story, you have many, many choices. mystery story, great. He executed it back to front. Whoa, that made it iconic. Right. So think of these things. And the fun part for me is when I've gone through all this development, 
and I've gone through, I know who my characters are, and I know what my location is, I know what my adversaries are, I know what some of my stories are, how do I now want to script it? Do I want to make it linear, non-linear, half linear, half non-linear? I mean, if you look at television, one reason why I think television is so exciting for me these days is the structures they're using to execute their stories are so unique from what we used to do. I mean, there's a series called This Is Us. I don't know if anybody knows yes. about that. I mean, look at the way they've told that story. There was a series called Revenge that did flashbacks within flashbacks, which every film teacher will tell you, that's impossible, you never do that, all right? I love when people say you never do that because that means everybody else is not gonna do it, <laughs> okay? Don't listen to that stuff. You do what appeals to you, okay? So, then you start writing your script, and your script will take you however long it takes you. I mean, you know, again, in the class, I give you a couple weeks, but, you know, you, you're working on your own if you're working through the system, and the thing is that once you finish with your script, I know people, and I know new writers in particular, they go like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing, what am I doing? And we call it the vomit draft. You know, <laughs> spit out the friggin' first draft. Don't, don't hone every page before you go to the next page. You know, you're gonna know this says one page at a time, it's a lot. Uh, <laughs> there are some writers who like working that way. There are some writers who say, look, I'm gonna write the first act, and then I'm gonna hone that before I go into my second act, and I go, great. That's the way you wanna work, that's fine. Um, but all of that might change by what you come up with for the second, third, fourth, and fifth act. So you spend your time on that now, be my guest. Spit it out, beginning to, beginning to end. You know, if you come to a spot that's giving you trouble, skip it to the spot that you know is coming next. And you'll come back to that. You make notes as you go along. Because then you have something to work with. You see, I often tell people, and I remember when I first started writing, you know, and they say, is this a first draft? And I go, oh my God, I, I did this twice. Can I call it a first draft if I did this twice? <laughs> I honestly now know that my process is to go through something about 13 times before I call it a first draft. Mm -hmm. All right, but you have to you have to learn that, have to get comfortable with that, um, and you have to realize that's the process. And you'll have good days, you'll have bad days, you'll have productive days, and believe me, there will be things that you keep thinking of that go, "Oh wow, how much stronger that would make this if I put this in here." And now with the computer, you can. You don't have to worry about whiteout. You don't have to worry about retyping. You don't have to worry about any of those other things. You just add it in, see how it goes. All right. So it really is good to do it in the two steps of, I, this is my story. This is how I think I want to make that story cinematically. And I know there are a lot of movies. I don't know if people uh, follow the structure of movies. One of the great techniques is they always start at the end of the second act and then work backwards. You know, the guy is in the tree ready to be hung, right? And the horse is whipped away, and that's the opening of the movie. And then you start from scratch, where he's in a bar, and where, blah, 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 until he gets to the end of the second act, where he's ready to be hung, and that's the kind of thing. So there are great techniques that you can try that can really make your story more exciting for you. And if it's more exciting for you, it'll be more exciting for the reader. So I suggest that you go that route. Once you finish that, once you've finished the vomit draft, okay, we now come to what I call the three C's. Um, the three C's are very simply um, the rewriting, which everything needs to be rewritten at some point, and the rewriting consists of cutting, combining, and compressing. There are things that you can look at as you go through your various drafts and say, I got five characters in this scene. Do I need all five characters? Can't one of these characters take, can't two of these characters be in one character? Yeah, do it. You know, I have this scene where, you know, the guy gets his hat and coat because he got this terrible phone call 
and he goes to start his car and it's gonna yes he has a flat and he calls AAA and AAA comes and he goes to the hospital and he rushes into the hospital and he gets lost and he runs into a, you know a nurse and tells him where his wife is in the room and he goes to the room he said couldn't you cut from the phone call to him entering the hospital good Think of how you can compress it and really condense the action. And what happens in TV in particular, and even in web series, in anything, you're fighting time. You're fighting page count. Page count is not only the length that something is going to go, but it also represents cost. If you come up with a web series script that's 15 pages long, you're not shooting that in a day. Sorry, it's going to be longer than that. Now, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying realize that. You're making the choices. These are your choices. And the same thing goes for um, just plain out cutting. You know, do I need this whole section here? Do I need this Do I need this subplot? You know, you've got your bomb and trap. It's, it's the nice thing about the computer. You've got them all saved on files that are, you know, sitting there in one long string. So. You can always go back to that, but what you will wind up with, the more you go through the really fine-tuning of what you've got, is something that's that much more readable, that much more exciting, or that much more funny, or humorous, or whatever it might be, because it takes time for all these things to work their way through you, you know. It's often, you know, at the gym, in a, in a spinning class, and I go, oh my God, what a great idea that instead of just going to the airport after that, what happens if he, he gets kidnapped or, or whatever? And that just comes to you. So give yourself the luxury of saying, I, you know, it's like they always used to say, do you want a Tuesday or do you want a good? You know, yeah, it's yeah. like, give yourself the luxury, particularly when you're doing spec work. When you're doing spec work, these are your passion projects, you know? Make them the absolute best they can be that suit you. Don't let anybody else tell you different. One of the, one of the um, things that I don't like about writers groups, and I've been in several of them, and I don't teach this way but because I know how I want to be treated as a writer, where they will tell me how they would do it. I, I, you know, I don't want to hear that you would make it three sisters and three, instead of three brothers. That's, that's not what I'm asking you. What I'm asking you is, do you believe the, the, the empathy between these three brothers? These three brothers. If you go, no, I really didn't think the other one liked the other one, or something, and I said, well, then I gotta fix that. Right. But don't tell me how you would do it. Help me get where I wanna go. And that's basically the way I teach and consult and do everything else. My job, or my passion in my mentoring is to get you the project you want. Whether it would be something I would want to look at or something I wouldn't want to, you want to, you, you want to do Friday the 13th? By all means, make it a good Friday the 13th. You know, do I want to watch it? Not particularly, but you do. And it's a huge genre. So that's the goal. I remember there was a head of NBC who recently died, Grant Tinker, who was known for quality, quality, quality television. You know, he had all the, the, the Mary Tyler Moore stuff and all down, and it came up to head NBC, and the first uh, show he put on the air was the A Team, and um, the press got on his, you know, case about you know Grant. I mean, you're Mr. Quality Team, you know, you know good television. I mean, you're putting on the A Team after all this stuff. He says, I guess I have to redefine what good is. You know, and that's basically it. Good becomes very simply. Did it succeed at what it set out to do? That's the judgment. I know, this one read, one thing I have with critics is they go on like, oh boy, I hated that. I mean, you know, believe me that 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 Alice in Wonderland story was so boring. Well, it's not for you. You know, don't tell me you hated it. Did it succeed at doing a good job of Alice in Wonderland? Was it a good animated feature? Was Shrek good? Was Shrek 5 good? You know, was Rocky 1 great? Was Rocky 4 great? You know, did it succeed at what it set out to do? 
that's the way I hope you approach your work. In whatever genre you're working in, whatever template you want, whatever format you want, it all applies to, this is the way I say it's all right, it applies whether this is a web series, whether it's a television series, whether this is a movie, whether this is a book, all these steps apply. All this process applies. So I hope that helps. Um, I have some books up here that I'm going to find a raffle ticket for. But are there any questions? Any additions, deletions? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, no, no, I, I okay. Let me see if this is the right answer. Does anybody have 421517? Oh, sorry. Can you give me that? No. Four two one five one seven? Oh, did somebody leave?